house is the same dog you see at the dog show, is the same dog you see at a hunting event. And that's why I got into Gordon's because, not because I'm Scottish, even though his family and half my family, the Pritchetts are Scottish, it's because I wanted to breed the dog that still hunted. So that's how I got into them. Uh, this is a breed that was actually invented. Uh, nowadays you hear and see all the different mixed breeds that people are selling to you. All those mixed breeds come from over 200 years, in some cases, 500 years of history behind them. And someone else already did the hard work, and then they're mix, mixing the breeds. The Gordon Setter goes back to the 1880s and beyond. The Duke of Gordon actually bred this breed, and it showed up um, at uh, the big shows in England. And they didn't actually name it after the Duke of Gordon till, till after he died and later. The Duke of Gordon basically wanted a dog that could do, uh, go out, point birds. And if you've never been to Scotland, which hopefully someday you won't get to, um, there's a lot of wetlands, a lot of marsh. It looks like around here. So they, he bred a dog that if you look at their feet, their feet are actually webbed. So that as they go across the wetlands, their feet just go straight down into the ground. And they're huge feet, and they seem unusual. They, if you notice, this is as tall as he's going to get. So the giant feet serve a purpose. Uh, they also, because Scotland has a lot of hills, a lot of rocks, a lot of terrain, you need a tough, shorter, muscled dog. So the Gordon Setters, when you, I, I brought up here a picture, this is all, there's four different kinds of setters. And the Gordon Setter is supposed to be the stockiest, heaviest boned of the breed, of the breed. The Irish Setters is known to be very tall and elegant and, and lots of flowing yeah, hair. And, um, and, and I tell people, I have trained many Irish Setters that actually hunt. Um, yes, they have hair and yes, and, and not as dumb as you think. And uh, the English Setter is the breed that you see all over this part of the country. They, the English setter, because it's white, doesn't get as hot in your, in your weather. And that's why you'll right. see a lot more white hunting dogs down here. It's because obviously we have a much more grueling summer than we do up north. So that's kind of why you don't tend to see Gordon setters down here, is it is very hard to have a black dog with this sort of sun. Um, how many people here ever had hunting dogs of any sort? See, you say a lot of people. Any of them have setters? Wow. And, and finding people that actually have setters is actually kind of rare um, because certain parts of the country there were like pockets of people that raised setters. And if you didn't have anyone that bred them, you wouldn't see them. And the same with Gordons. Gordons are relatively rare. Um, in England and in uh, Europe, they've been on the endangered species list. Unbelievable. But as a breed, um, we never had great numbers, and then um, they were doing like just just doing a survey of who had what breeds. And the Gordon Center was like they used to have, you know, about 500 born a year, and suddenly they went down to less than 100. So in Europe, the Duke of Gordon, you can actually go to Facebook, type in Gordon Castle. The Gordon Castle is now promoting Gordon Centers again, uh, and it is. It's uh, amazing that the family went, oh, we're the reason for it? <laughs> yeah, it was shocking that they didn't really know that about 30 years ago, that they are really the origins of the breed. So now they actually, May 15th is a uh, thing in the Duke of Gordon's castle where you bring your Gordon Setters and they get to meet all the Gordon Setters. And someday I will make it there with a dog. But uh, taking a dog overseas is tedious and your dog, believe it or not, has to have a passport. Uh, and it looks just like your passport. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a tedious process to take a dog to overseas. But uh, what, who you have here is a very well-known dog, a Tartanus Crusader. And uh, Crusader, um, he has a show title. He has a hunting title. And he is getting a competition hunting title also. So this dog doesn't just look good. He also is, has the natural instinct to point. Pointing is when the dog stops, when it smells a bird. And you see all those statues where a dog's standing there with its little foot up? That is called pointing. 
Everyone sees the statue, doesn't understand what it's for, but it, what it was is when you would go off hunting on a plantation or at a preserve, there's birds out there, and where do you start looking? The whole idea, that's the dog's job. The dog's job, it's hide and seek for dogs, as I tell people. Out there on that thousand acres, somewhere are birds. You can walk until you flush them, or you can set your dog loose, which I think is much easier. So you set your dog loose, the dog goes out, and, and as you feel the wind, the wind has to be in the dog's face so they can smell the bird. So you'll see the dog think through. We, we, I tell people, we breed a dog that thinks on its own, and then we complain when it's too smart to learn something. So just remember that, that we set these dogs loose, and they naturally learn how to work their way into the wind. They'll crisscross what's called casting, They'll do like a little Z pattern, and they'll work their way into the wind until they smell a bird, and then they'll head towards it. And then about 20, 30 feet away, usually in the wild, the dog will stop, tail up, and just face his nose straight at the bird so that you could go in there and then go and shoot it. I personally almost never shoot a bird. I carry a blank pistol because at the events we go to are called non shoot to kill uh, which means if we set loose birds on wildlife areas and leave them behind. One weekend we can set loose 300, 350 quail a weekend. There's a couple of competitions that use pheasants. They'll set loose 300 pheasants a weekend and we leave them behind hoping, crossing our fingers that they'll, they'll uh, naturalize and stay in the area. So, when you see these events, no, realize most of the time we're, we're never shooting a bird at, at, at all because we just we don't feel that that's necessary. So, um, we go out, we set birds loose on the property, and it's seek and find. It's, it's a really, it's a needle in a haystack. And this is the only reason why you find a bird when you're going over, most of these properties are five, six hundred acres, and we go out there and we walk for an hour, we walk for a half hour, and you cross your fingers that your dog knows what it's doing, <laughs> finds a bird, points a bird, and then what he does is he's supposed to stand perfectly still. This all looks really easy on paper. Dog finds a bird, stands there. You step in front of the dog, whoa. Ah, that's a kid, whoa. You step in front of the dog, you flush the bird, you fire your cap gun, and you walk back to the dog and you go, what a perfect little dog. And you go on and you find the next one. Looks really easy on paper until the bird flies at the dog. <laughs> until the dog goes, but, but I really feel like chasing it today. And off he goes. My favorite was I had a pheasant. I, I, I'm like, the pheasant's where she's sitting. And I flush the pheasant forward, and the pheasant literally goes straight over me like a jet. Turns around and aims, I mean, literally does, does one of these. Wham! Smacks into my dog, and my dog just went, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he backed up three feet, and the pheasant was still sitting there, and, and the, the guy judging the event, so, like, applauding the dog. I, I don't know how you trained for that. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I trained for that, right? Um, so I tell people, it, it looks real simple on paper, but everything can go wrong. And, and you're, you can't control the weather, you can't control the wind. Mother Nature hates us, so she's always throwing rain, sleet, snow, hail at us. Or we'll come down here, like this time there's a couple events going on. Now, you, you guys down here, because it gets so hot so fast, most of your events are in January, February, March, for obvious reasons for the heat. And yet, I've been down here in January. 75 flipping Dad, degrees. <laughs> and my dog just left Ohio, which is, you know, you know, 10. So, so I tell people, I says, even when you try to plan things, I, you, it doesn't always work. But, um, but uh, to get a really well-trained dog um, can take you two to three years of constant work, training. It's, it's no different than you learning a new skill, the dog's learning a new skill. It takes a lot of repetition and patience, and you just, you just keep doing it until the dog does it right. And uh, AKC, the American Kennel Club, has uh, several different kinds of events for hunting. There are private clubs that run events for hunting. Uh, there's, uh, there are lots of different ways of getting your dog around hunting events if you want to. 
Um, and as I said, down here, you guys probably, the, the closest thing you'll get to a Gorn Center is an English Center around here. I did bring with me, this is a, a, a history book of Gorn's up to this date. Uh, this, this was written in the 80s. This is a children's book that came out called Just Setters that all of them, I think, were bought up by us setter people, of course. <laughs> but uh, in it has Gordon setters, it has the English setters. It is missing one of the setters, uh, which is called an Irish red and white. When you look at an old painting, you know, the ones from the 1500s, the 1400s, there's a white and red dog. It's called the Irish red and white setter. It's the origins of all our breeds comes from them, and they just started uh, preserving that breed about 60, 70 years ago. They started bringing that breed back. Uh, Ireland, because they're called Irish Red and White Setters. Uh, the Irish government got involved. It's amazing what they do in Europe with dog breeding, but the government got involved to preserve that breed, and uh, we own a couple of those, and I, ca I got some, for, and I still hunt them also. So uh, this book is now out of date. I'm going to harass the uh, writer of the book <laughs> to come up with a new one. But you all can see all the different kind of setters in this book. And this photo is one of my favorite. This is the blur of your dog chasing that bird as it took off. <laughs> yeah, you just worked for six months to teach that dog to point birds and do it right. And this is what they usually do to you on the first time you go real hunting, is, is they chase them. And I thought it was hilarious that the guy put that photo in there, because that's real life. That's, you know, it's like sending your kid off to ballet class and they stand up there and cry. So, you know, same thing, you're like, what is going on? But we're going to go down here.